The riffs are too repetitive, the lyrics make no sense All the songs are b-sides and the cover art's a mess There's so much here to tear apart Listen to it for a week Now that week has passed why I hate this album podcast with Tim and Garrett. Hello and welcome to another episode of Why I Hate This Album. I am one of your hosts, Garrett Harvey. With me as always, co-host extraordinaire, the bacon on my cheeseburger, Timothy Richardson. Tim, how you doing, buddy? Pretty damn good, Garrett. Pretty damn good. I'm glad to hear it. That's unusual for you and the show. What's got you in good spirits? Well, by the time this episode is released, this won't be the case, but the election hasn't happened yet, so that's good. And we're recording this just after Halloween. I've had a really good, really interesting Halloween. Okay, well, now I'm immediately suspicious and concerned. Explain yourself. I just had a good Halloween. We went out. Well, if we didn't go out, I went out with my friends, of course. Uh, mm. you did a little trick-or-treating. Mm. I right. participated. Participated in a new Halloween tradition that I came up with. It was just, it was a good, it was a good Halloween. Okay. I'm going to bypass the comment about friends for just a minute. What is your new Halloween tradition? And bear in mind, Tim, this is probably admissible to a court of law. Oh, it's based on the Halloween classic Final Destination. I call it Final Destinationing. (laughs) Okay. I am very curious slash concerned. Go on. I mean, it's very simple. It's basically what the movie is, Garrett. I find a small scale natural disaster and I hunt hmm. the survivors. <laughs> It's sometimes, like your own personal purge. Yeah, you know, I mean, sometimes I dress as the Grim Reaper to kind of give those people in their last moments a thrill, but eh, sometimes I get lazy and I don't. And either way, yeah. it's the perfect crime. Oh, man. I got to say, Tim, there's a lot to unpack there and I don't even know that we have the time. But I will say, as silly as it may sound to a listeners that you might dress up as the Grim Reaper, I would much prefer the Grim Reaper outfit. At least there's some theatricality and, you know, I kind of know what's up. This is what I've been expecting versus if you just get lazy about it and I get murdered by a guy in a pair of basketball shorts and a Austin Ice Bats jersey. Oh, absolutely. I, I mean, that makes complete sense. What if I'm wearing the mask, but also the Ice Bats in the basketball shorts? I suppose it depends on what you mean by the mask. <laughs> Sorry, the Grim Reaper mask, the super realistic Grim Reaper mask that tricks people who have just survived <laughs> small scale natural disasters into believing I am in fact the Grim Reaper, which technically is true because as I previously mentioned, I'm hunting them. Right. Maybe work on that f- framing a little, but... Uh, I'm committing I, murders. I, I, there I it is. Am, Thanks I for am, putting a finer point on yeah. it. This is fascinating. We have a whole album to talk about, so as much as it pains me, we're going to have to take that off mics, but we will. One last question. I guess I really can't move off of this quite yet. Why? What? Are you restoring some sort of balance to the world? No, I just love the franchise. Oh, okay. Okay. It's an homage. (laughs) Tim, that is a huge relief. I (laughs) thought you were just out there for the thrill of taking another person's life, but this is a celebration of film. Yeah. Yeah, I don't enjoy it. It's like dressing up for a Rocky Horror or a midnight screening. You're just a fan. Yeah. (sighs) Great tradition, Tim. I I can't wait to maybe go out with you and your friends. And for those of us who have had those of you who haven't found the feed, I am doing the air quotes on that one because it is a well-established fact. Tim does not have friends. Don't look at me like that. <laughs> it's so hurtful and true. Well, you're the one who brought up the fake ones, so that's it's important. We yeah. don't lie to our listeners. That's fair. Tim, what album have we been <laughs> listening to for an entire week and are going to spend the next hour or so talking about? We have been listening to the 21st Beach Boys studio album, The Beach Boys Love You, released April 11th, 1977. This was suggested by Luther Hurt and probably some other people on different platforms. Now, Tim, I'm curious, do you hate this album? Oh, God, no, Garrett. I I might actually like this. It's not good. It's really creepy. It Mm -hmm. shows how far they have fallen, Mm. but it's so weird. It has its own sort of charm. Also, for a week, I listened to the Brian Wilson song, Smart Girls, so I know the depths that Brian Wilson is capable of sinking to, and I can't hate this at all. I think you're you're going to have an uphill battle to get me there this week. But again, I have listened to this way too much. I mean, this album in the last week has sort of become a part of me. I hmm. Even now, I have trouble determining where this album stops and I begin. Fascinating. Yeah. Uh, if not confusing. <laughs> <laughs> what about you, Garrett? Do you hate this? Listen, I'm about to say two things that I'm not thrilled about. One, no, I don't hate this. And two, 
I largely agree with you. Oh. It's so strange, and I think that this could be a Stray Cat Blues situation. We may have to hate it just purely on a moral standing. You didn't hate Stray Cat Blues, to be clear. You I liked have it. looser morals than you. <laughs> uh, Jesus Christ. For those of you that don't know what's in that song, go back oh, and listen to that episode. <laughs> And no, Garrett, totally okay with that song because, no, that's not because what I mean. of his loose morals. No, no, that's not what I mean. Tim, is this the first time your Brian has been Wilsoned? Oh, of course not. I mean, we did last week, obviously, but I had never heard this particular album before. I think I mentioned this last week. I enjoy the Beach Boys in sort of a limited sense. I love Pet Sounds. I love the Smile Sessions. And from the pre-Pet Sounds era, I enjoy the greatest hits. They seem like a weird weird novelty band that has somehow released 51 hit wonders about surfing and being a teenager in 1960s California. And I think mm-hmm. that a lot of it is good if you're in the right mood for it. So, I, I mean, this is definitely not the first time I have honked down the gosh darn highway, if you will. Wait, no, it is. Not. It is the first time because I haven't yeah. heard this yeah. album. What about you, though? Is this the first time the Beach Boys have ever loved you? Of course not, Tim. Now, obviously, just like you, first time I've heard this wretched album. But just like you, I love the hits. Big fan of Brian Wilson's work to create pet sounds. Smile less so. But, uh, you know, I, I like the hits. Basically, anything past 1967 with the Beach Boys, I, I could care less about. But prior to that, you know, not bad. I, as a real small child was enamored with the fact that sometimes TV's John Stamos would play with the Beach Boys. Oh, yeah. That might have been your introduction to them. I mean, it actually might have been. (laughs) (laughs) All right, Tim, that's my history. That's your history. Some might even say that's our history. But before we can talk about the album itself, we need to understand just a touch about this band. So, you know, in a simple, succinct, and I'm sure incredibly short way, sum up a band whose career spans somewhere in the neighborhood of 60 years. Sure. I may stop somewhere around 1977, if that's okay. Feel free to stop earlier. The Beach Boys were formed by brothers Brian, Dennis, and Carl Wilson, who were 16, 13, and 11, kind of when they started playing music together, as well as cousin Mike Love and friend slash random guy Al Jardine. Brian and his brothers, they had musical instruments and music lessons as children. Their father, Murray, played piano. They sang in choirs. By the time Brian was 16, he had spent a lot of time listening to 50 50s bands, specifically the four freshmen, and also a bunch of R&B acts that were just starting to get popular on the radio. He started learning how to sing those songs. He taught his brothers to sing backup, and they recorded some early attempts on a tape recorder that Bri Bri got for his 16th birthday. After Brian performed at a high school talent show, his classmate Al Jardine joined the band, and Mike Love named them the Pendletones. And you had a question about this last week, so I looked it up. Apparently, Pendleton is a wool shirt and they changed it to Pendle Tones so it's musical like the Beatles. It's a pun you see. Oh, that is terrible. Yes. Yes, it is. It's also, a, who knows wool, their wool shirts? shirts. <laughs> <laughs> it was apparently very popular at the time. <laughs> I'm just picturing ladies and gentlemen coming to the stage the Pendle Tones like the shirt. <laughs> <laughs> the one guy out of the audience. <laughs> ladies and gentlemen coming to the stage a uh, wool shirt. No. No. Change it. James no. <laughs> the wool shirts. No, they didn't have a Gino, Tim. <laughs> so nobody in the band surfed, except for Dennis. At all. No one in the band, except for Dennis, seemed to like the beach. At all. <laughs> now, that is particularly surprising. The surfing part, sure. Most people don't do the things they sing about, as we've discovered. I hope not, yeah. because otherwise, this album, I hate it. <laughs> oh, yeah, I hate it. I, I Maybe we ought to put together some sort of burning session. It's, Are you saying we should anyway. become vigilantes and do some sort of citizen's arrest on Brian Wilson? Because I'm in. Maybe. Yeah, I'm a little in. Anyway, no. I. God damn you. I will no, I Batman Brian Wilson. <laughs> That's clear. But you're obviously Robin. I'll give you Nightwing, maybe. Ooh, I like him. He's kind of his own man. He used to be the subordinate, but now he's struck out on his own. Sometimes he's the Red Hood. I got HBO all- Max. <laughs> yeah, I was about to say, man, when did you learn about the DC <laughs> Comics world? <laughs> there's a bunch of movies on there, and I got nothing to do all day because I'm unemployed. <laughs> That was that was all spot on. <laughs> <laughs> 
Yeah. What was I talking about? Oh, right. Who hates the beach? Well, I, I mean, Brian Wilson, Garrett. Look at him. Yeah, except for that time he made a beach in his living room. Well, he doesn't like being outside with other people. Got it. Anyway, even though no one else surfed, Dennis convinced everyone to sing about Southern California and surfing, etc. Brian wrote Surfin. It's their first single. Mike Love and Brian wrote Surfin Safari. Their dad hated the idea, but he <laughs> took their demos to Candex and ERA Records, who signed the Pendletones. The owner of both labels, Herb, wanted to rename the band Surfers without their permission, but another one of the suits that worked there mentioned that there was already a different band named Surfers, so they renamed the band The Beach Boys without their permission or knowledge. You know, I don't typically support suits, but I gotta say in this instance, good call, guys. Yeah, well, Pendletones is a stupid name. Like the shirt! (laughs) (laughs) The first single, Surfing, was a huge success, well, at least Given the novelty and given that they've never really recorded anything before, it hit number 75 on the Billboard Hot 100, but weirdly ended up bankrupting Candix Records because they had a ton of unpaid orders. So basically a bunch of people pulled a Garrett Harvey slash Columbia House record scam. I don't think it was a scam. I think it was their business model. Send you a bunch of stuff. Do not collect a dollar. Okay. Well, they didn't collect any dollars on that record and a lot of people wanted it and then they went bankrupt. The dad got them the first actual concert for a 1961 New Year's Eve show, and then Al Jardine left to become a dentist, never to be heard from again. That's not true. No, it's not, but he did leave to become a dentist. (laughs) Okay. They had some trouble getting signed to a new label because it was kind of believed that they were going to be a one-hit wonder with surfing because, you know, how many songs can you possibly write about surfing? (laughs) Oh, my God. (laughs) Some sort of... (laughs) Right, well, because they got got a seven-year contract with Capitol Records to release, essentially, surfing and surfing safari and surfing surf in USA and surfer girl and surf, surf, surf a lots and smurf surfs like a- and... <laughs> I think we might be dealing with some sort of monkey paw situation, Tim. <laughs> we want to become big time rock and roll surf stars. Oh, yes, you will. You will become rock and roll stars about surfing. And that's just all they can write hit songs about. They have other ideas, but they're not allowed to use them. <laughs> the only the surfing ones will be hits. <laughs> that might actually be 100% accurate. You look at late day performances, they're soulless. And they're still singing that goddamn surfer girl. <laughs> so they got the seven year contract with Capital records and released their second single Surf and Safari with 409 and that hit number 14. And then the album Surf and Safari was released in 1962. They started gaining popularity. Their early shows were often marked with people just throwing vegetables at them from the audience because their surf music didn't sound like surf rock. They had vocals and didn't do a bunch of weird reverb stuff. So fuck the posers. Hmm, okay. Surf in USA as a single came out in 1963 followed by the album by the same name, which hit number two on the Billboard 200 and got them a national audience. And Brian started to come into his own as a producer. He started producing both Beach Boys records and other artists, including the Honeys. Al Jardine rejoined initially to tour and then just became a member again. And then they did Surfer Girl, which was the first time Brian was the sole producer. Then, in 1964, the Beatles came to the US and hopped on Capitol Records, and the Beach Boys kind of got pushed to the side. But Brian really saw Phil Spector as their main competition, not the Beatles. He didn't see that early British invasion sound as the sound of the future. In rock and roll, he saw Phil Spector's recording techniques. And Brian then did the Beach Boys Christmas album with a 40-plus piece orchestra as a response to a Phil Spector Christmas album. And I'm sure there's (laughs) at least one song for a Christmas pee-pee-sode in that collection because they did a bunch of originals. Oh, yeah, they did. And then in 1964, Brian had a panic attack on a flight from LA to Houston and just announced he wouldn't be touring anymore and said he was going to focus entirely on songwriting and production. They brought in Glenn Campbell initially to cover for him and then Bruce Johnston. And Carl kind of became the de facto band leader for the live stuff, I guess. Hmm. At this point, Brian wanted to stop making music about surfing and started using significantly more drugs, including psychedelics. He started having auditory hallucinations. And then they released The Beach Boys Today, which had more of an album feel instead of just a collection of singles. There's a couple more albums between that and Pet Sounds, which was written with Tony Asher and was sort of a response to the Beatles' Rubber Soul. Had a lot more interesting production techniques, not just a collection of songs about surfing or 409ing. If you don't like the Beach Boys, but know nothing about 
pet sounds, it's worth a Google. Between YouTube and Wikipedia, learn about Brian Wilson's almost slavish desire to get the sound just right, up to and including bringing in untold numbers of musicians, ranging from symphonies, orchestras, to didgeridoos. Oh, absolutely. You get a- yeah, Pet Sounds is not a Beach Boys album. Pet Sounds is a Brian Wilson solo album that I guess the Beach Boys sing back up on. The rest of the band went to Japan and Hawaii on tour, and when they came back, Brian basically just showed them what he'd been working on, which was Pet Sounds, and told them that's what they were going to be doing next. The rest of the band pretty much does not like this. They don't like the music and they don't really like the, I guess, the dynamic here. Even to this day, if you go see the Beach Boys or the Mike Love version of the Beach Boys, they'll do Sloop John B and Wouldn't It Be Nice, but they're not going deep into pet sounds, which is kind of a shame. Yeah. At this point also, Derek Taylor was hired to kind of reinvent the band's image. He was a publicist that had worked for the Beatles in the past. He came up with the Brian Wilson is a Genius marketing campaign. The Beatles then did Sergeant Peppers as a response to Pet Sounds, at least according to Paul McCartney, who has said repeatedly that God Only Knows was his favorite song, at least at the time. Then they do Good Vibrations, a song which cost over $400,000 in today's money, and that became a huge hit for them. Their album, Smile, that that was supposed to go on, was not a huge hit, partially because Brian wouldn't stop tinkering with the recordings, and partially because he was just going insane at this point. He believed that one of the songs in those sessions, alternately called Fire and Mrs. Leary's Cow, was responsible for a building burning down. (laughs) Boy, you know, if you're looking for a way to summarize what's Brian Wilson's head thinking (laughs) at this point, like how do you you impose upon the listener who may not have a good frame of reference just how crazy and unstable he's become? That might be it. He believes a song caused a building to burn down. Well, it was about a fire, you see. Mm -hmm. Also, Carl got himself arrested by the FBI for refusing to be drafted. (laughs) The entire Smile project was scrapped until 2004, or at least the Brian Wilson version of it. The band released Smiley Smile in 1967 instead, and there was basically an immediate downturn in their fortunes. Hendrix referred to them as psychedelic barbershop quartet music, and critics just kind of didn't really like this. They did Wild Honey. That also didn't do particularly well, and their star kind of starts to fade toward the end of the 60s. Mike Love went with the Beatles to India. The Beach Boys toured with uh, Maharishi for, they were supposed to do like 30 shows, and after about five, the Maharishi decided, eh, I don't want to do this, and just left. Okay. Yep. Then Dennis Wilson made friends with the inspiration for Garrett Harvey's 2006 to 2009, Mr. Charles Manson, who he brought around the studio and tried to get signed. The Beach Boys actually recorded a Manson song, Cease to Exist. They retitled it, Never Learn Not to Love. And as they tended to do, Manson and his followers basically took over Dennis's house before they committed a few murders or whatever. And then Brian went to the psych hospital. (laughs) Okay. Great place to pause for just a second. And I don't want to get hung up on details. We got a lot of episode to go. I'm sorry. Did you say Charles Manson, whom I emulated from 2006 to 2009? He was your inspiration for those years. Yes. Okay. I can't disagree with that part. Yeah. So Dennis is friends with him. He kind of terrified Brian. (laughs) Dennis kept bringing Charles Manson to hang out with Brian, who is apparently just crippled with guilt for killing all those people in that fire that his song caused. (laughs) Yeah, he didn't want to hang out with Charles Manson because he can see the devil in his eyes. Yeah. I mean, you look at that guy. He had crazy eyes. Yeah, he he, he definitely did. Also, the swastika that he fucking carved into his forehead. Yeah, but that was years later. Oh, sure, sure. But you can look at a person. You can look them in the eyes and tell whether or not they're going to carve a swastika into their forehead. You look at 1968, 1969 Charles Manson, you can just tell. Oh, yeah. You, first the words out of your mouth, where's the swastika? That's right. Anyway, nobody cares about the Beach Boys for much of the early 70s. They kept releasing music. Some of it wasn't bad. Uh, 1970s Sunflower isn't bad. And they mounted a comeback basically by releasing live and compilation albums. So mm. they kind of positioned themselves as a nostalgia act for something that had happened three years before. During this time, Brian hides in his chauffeur's quarters of his house doing heroin, other drugs, drinking, ballooning up to 300 plus pounds, hanging out with Alice Cooper, all before falling under the care of Eugene Landy, who honestly... 
Wesley at first kept him out of trouble with constant supervision and observation. He was the psychotherapist that refused to let him do anything without his permission for 14 months or so. In 1976, Brian decided to produce the band again with Landy in tow. He wanted to do a bunch of doo-wop standards. Carl and Dennis wanted to do original songs, and Mike Love and Al Jardine just wanted to stop arguing and release a record. The rest <laughs> of the band overdubbed Brian's vocals without his consent, and they released the album 15 Big Ones. Nobody liked it. No one. You know, a lot of times you'll hear these later albums are divisive. This one wasn't. Everyone hates it. Brian got rid of Landy, and they got back to work on their next album while doing a bunch of mental rehab and drug rehabilitation. And that turned out to be the 21st Beach Boys studio album, the album of the week, The Beach Boys Love You. Now, Brian would later call Love You one of his favorite Beach Boys albums, and he said, that's when it all happened for me. That's where my heart Hmm. lies. And then he was asked, if you're trying to get into the Beach Boys at this point, what should you listen to? And he said, Pet Sounds first, then Beach Boys Love You. The Hmm. engineer on the album compared the experience in the final product to the movie Eraserhead. (laughs) Okay, so he gets it. I just want to leave it with that, that Brian Wilson at the time and currently is pretty sure this is the second best thing the Beach Boys have done. So that's where I'm going to leave the story since that's all the context the good people of 1977 had for this album with one exception. And that is that Brian Wilson had a follow-up planned for this album. And that was to be called Adult Slash Child, a big band swing Frank Sinatra style album that was rejected by Reprise Records for not being commercially viable. But before we talk about what's on this album, I just wanted to get that album title in the mix. Adult Child. An adult that's a it's a child or possibly vice versa. Some may describe certain hosts of this show as adult children. I wouldn't say that about you. I mean, you're got that beard. I mean, on the outside, you're definitely an adult. And I would say you're the more mature one. So you're, you're not an yep, adult so child. So far, we agree to. All right. Should we shake hands yeah. or? No, no, no. Give me your not hand. Not necessary. <laughs> Damn it, dude. You, I'm saying you're an adult child. <laughs> this is why. This is why. Would you please let go of my hand? <laughs> no. <laughs> not until adults do. you shake. Uh, what are we doing? I'm mean, struggling. <laughs> I know, okay. I know, I know. You're struggling and you're not shaking. <laughs> I hate this. Shake my goddamn hand. General anyway. thoughts. Yeah, great <laughs> history, Tim. Okie dokie. What the fuck is this? I don't know, man. Top to bottom, musically, the studio atmosphere, lyrically, this is bizarre. I mean, it's not good. None of this is good, but it's fascinating. Like, I had a good time listening to this album. I don't yeah. like it, but <laughs> I, I enjoyed this week. Yeah, it's 14 tracks. It feels really quick. The songs are pretty short. Yeah, it moves. Give them what that. type of music is this? So I don't know. <laughs> Most of it's done with analog synthesizers. It's the mini Moog. Yeah. The arrangements, they were all inspired apparently by Wendy Carlos's 1968 album Switched on Bach, a collection of Johannes Sebastian Bach compositions performed entirely on a Moog synthesizer. The- Tim, what are your feelings on a Moog? synthesizer in general? Do they have a place in music for you? Absolutely, but it should not be the lead instrument and it also should not be the bass for your song, right? It's there to <laughs> accent things in my mind. All right. I come at it from a slightly different direction. Only uh, Moog. It's rare we only Moog. Moog, mini Moog. Let's get a Korg in the mix. I only want synth. I mean, I have gone to see, oh, what's the name of that fucking band? They do the Stranger Things soundtrack. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, I mean, that's just fucking like four or five Five dudes standing at some synths, not singing. Oh, yeah. And I don't I don't want any part of that. But <laughs> I think it's very effective in the show and for the same reason, because it's not the focus. It's accenting what you're seeing. And same thing if you have right. a song. If you're going to have a rock song that's accented with a some synth. Yeah. Got no problem right. with that. Yeah. So I have more tolerance for it for sure. But what we can definitely agree on, I think, is no matter what, if you are going to have synth as a primary component... Mix it with any number of things. I'm not even going to try to list the various musical instrument styles, artists, or arrangements that would complement heavy synth use. 
but don't under any circumstances, no matter what anyone tells you. Combine it with the soothing sounds of a bygone era known as the Beach Boys. It's true. It is jarring. I threw up for the first three songs. Oh, yeah. No, I've had many a seizure this week. <laughs> I was curious what that was about. I thought you were experimenting with Alka-Seltzer again. Oh, yeah. Well, I mean, you know, I, I don't necessarily appreciate it that you didn't put your wallet in my mouth, but- There's a know. new wallet, Tim. It's here. What's, what's done is done. Anyway, so the vast majority of this is done on a Moog synthesizer. The mixing was mostly done with the wall of sound approach, the kind of Phil Spector thing. And then Carl Wilson actually remixed a lot of this in early 77, and he overdubbed uh, some guitar and some extra percussion and some stuff like that. To cu- so basically, this is done backward. Instead of you making a song and then overdubbing a little bit of synth to kind of, you know, <laughs> fill it out, it out. they yeah. did the opposite. Or you can go that third route, that that t- tried and true route, record the entire album album T to B full band, then secretly go back afterwards and redo the whole thing with synth and vocoder. Yeah. Well, it's as you always said, Crazy Horse sucks and shouldn't be on an album. I've always said it. The atmosphere in the studio. So the same producer slash engineer that called this eraser head like described this. He said that the studio time was actually booked by Landy, the therapist, and Landy was there <laughs> to force him to be productive. He said it was the only way he'd get his dinner. That's a direct quote. Being productive is the only way he'd get his dinner. So Landy's just there with a fanny pack full of marshmallows on a stick? Sort of. So Landy would reward Wilson with cannabis <laughs> while performing his therapist duties. <laughs> Guess what? If you're spoon feeding your patients drugs, you're not (laughs) performing your therapist duties. Let me one up you. Another person from the studio said that a quote unquote associate of Landy's would stand next to Wilson with a baseball bat to, and I'm quoting here, further his creative inspiration. So this album was produced under the promise of if you finish this, you get pot. If you don't, I'll break your knees. Yeah, he's basically Bart the bear. Put him in a karate gi. <laughs> Make him wrestle yeah. a Russian guy. Maybe the whole band isn't there at the same time and there's a man threatening to break your knees. Sure, I'll play the song on a synth. I'll get it all together. We're done. We're done. Yeah. Let me out. Yeah, watch how on board Tim gets about <laughs> moogs. <laughs> you threaten to kneecap That's him. That's right. Or if you promise me marijuana, which of course I don't know if I'd like. Yeah, you'd love the opportunity to find out though. You just don't know where to find it. That's true. And then, I mean, finally, lyrically, I'm not, I mean, we're going to get into a lot of lyrics on here. Yeah. I think the only appropriate way for like six of these songs to end is with a Chris Hansen cameo. Just, just uh, <laughs> why don't you have a seat, Brian? I tried viciously this week to not turn sinister. Oh, I did immediately, immediately. And then I started weaving together a tapestry about how this is a concept album. I'll aim toward that. Oh God, dude, we (laughs) are in for it. I guess I'll say it up top, folks. We're probably looking at an after dark episode. (laughs) Yeah. And not one of those fun ones. One of those more like we all need a shower because Tim went too far. No, Brian Wilson goes too far. Okay. So a couple of follow-up items. As for type of music, I sort of characterize this as Billy Joel rock and roll. Like, we're rocking and rolling, but this is not rock and roll. Right, yes. You rock or you roll, but never at the same time. Maybe it's rock and roll, but it's certainly not rock and roll. This is your father's rock and roll. I think this might just be roll. Strictly roll, there's no rock. I would agree with that. I fear that most people will not take the time to listen to this album, and I'm not sure that I can tell them. At least listen to a few tracks, because Listen to Honkin' Down the Highway. It's real funny. Or Roller Skating Girl. Nope. It's not funny. Nope. <laughs> or, I'm sorry, Roller Skating Child. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Listen to Johnny anyway. Carson or <laughs> Johnny Hawking Carson's down the highway. <laughs> I forgot how fun this album is. It's so weird. Yeah, it's uh, real good. Listen to this. I love but, this album. But in case you don't, it is fart rock. Like, it's just not rock. As Tim put it, simply roll. But with Beach Boys sounds and arrangements. Yeah. And teen sentiments expressed by men in their mid to late 30s. Yes. Also 300 plus pounds. <laughs> Like, well, like when you when you, you keep you, feeding them those marshmallows. Yeah. <laughs> when you imagine these songs and the lyrics that we are going to read, just imagine this is like a 35-year-old Brian Wilson who's 
312 pounds. He's bearded. His shirt won't close. He's got a therapist there with a fanny pack full of pot and some sort of Russian guy with a baseball bat. That's the image, right? Yeah. So the cover of it looks, I think it's supposed to look like a tapestry or something, but it kind of looks like an 8-bit video game. Somebody went back and redid this album with all 8-bit sounds. Hmm. I might enjoy that even more. Well, I'm sure you'd enjoy it more. How could you not? All right, Tim, I think we've done a really good job of setting the table, so let's get the fuck into it. Track number one, Let Us Go On This Way. He's 35. He's 315 pounds. It seems like he's either really leaning into nostalgia or he might be dressing like a high schooler and attempting to attend a local high school. That's exactly what I think is happening. Yeah. You got to keep in mind his frame of mind at this time, Tim. To I, Adult the child. Idea, yeah. He's probably enrolled himself as a freshman at the local high school. And that's what this song is definitely about. Let's get into some lyrics. Where do you want to start? To get to you, baby, I went through the ringer. Ain't gonna let you slip through my fingers. Going to school isn't my fondest desire, but sitting in class, you set my soul on fire. So let me stop right there. Perfect. He is going to school. He doesn't like going to school. He's going to school for a lady. Mm -hmm. Well, not a lady, girl. His fondest desire. Yes. Now, Tim, we could make this a little more fun. Now, as we've already agreed, this is a full-grown 35-year-old man, let's say, at best. Yeah. He's got a uh, backward hat on. His shirt won't close. <laughs> he's wearing Converse All-Stars. He's hasn't shaved his beard. Perhaps he's put a Band-Aid over a mustache. <laughs> You know, and no, 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 no. Okay. I like the picture you're painting. It's probably far more accurate. I'll give you an alternate reading just for fun. You tell me how, which way you want to take it. We could have a Mrs. Doubtfire situation going on here. What if in order to get close to this girl, he can't just be another guy in school. He wants to get on the volleyball team with her. So it's a real dude <gasps> looks like a lady. Yeah. Oh. Montage of 315 pound Brian Wilson going through a bunch of series of looks. So, so he just, in your mind, he's, he is trying to be a sophomore more in high school, yes. but a lady. Well, a girl. Right, so that he can get close to this this girl that he's into, uh, but he's going to get the inside Maybe, edge. maybe so okay, here's what's happening. Okay, so he wants to date this high schooler, okay? So he's <laughs> dressed he's dressed as Brian Wilson, the sophomore. He's simultaneously misdoubtfiring it as his own sister. Yes. Who, <laughs> who, who he's using to get information from this girl so that he can use it as Brian Wilson. Wilson, high school sophomore, to date her. This is genius. So you got a lot of costume changes. He's enrolled as two students. <laughs> he got to the school. <laughs> What's even better about that is that maybe presupposes that first he enrolled as a boy for some reason. <laughs> well, and then we once why. he got there, became enamored with this girl, it was like, I know how to get close to her. <laughs> Instead of doing this, he just pitched this as a movie. This might be a classic. Oh, yeah. Because this is oh, a yeah. this is a great movie, if only it weren't about about, you know, 34-year-old, 315-pound Brian Wilson <laughs> pretending to be two children in an attempt to, at best, date a child. But as we're going to find out in this album, the at-best scenario never happens. <laughs> no, it's always the <laughs> at worst. Uh, okay. <laughs> to be clear, having said all those horrible things, I kind of like it. It's charming. It's <laughs> weird. It's so <laughs> weird. This is as if, like, Garrett was just like, hey, I don't know any Beach Boys, but I wanted to make a Beach Boys <laughs> album, so I did it all myself, and I had to learn most of the instruments, and I only spent about a week on it. Here's what I came up with. Like, it's charming. Yeah, it's worthy of being hung on the fridge. Yes. Or possibly in a museum as an oddity. But it's not commercial music. It's no. not pop music. <laughs> Absolutely not. He goes on, though, God, please let us go this way. All day long I practiced what to say, A. Eh? I think about this game that I like to play play a when i leave you i'm so depressed because you're my only happiness god please let us go on this way he's practicing he is running a scheme i mean again a mrs doubtfire scheme oh sure now what sport is it i picked volleyball that seems logical as to why he's a giant yeah i mean i, I think that makes sense he's just the 315 pound bearded freshman girl that's gonna cozy up Tim, to it's a it's a difficult time in a young woman's life you, 
look a lot like your brother. We're paternal twins. Is that the right word? Anyway. Dizygotic. What was it in the last terrible Star Wars? Some sort of dyad of the Force? Oh, yes. God, I hate that movie. <laughs> anyway, speaking of bullshit, the song continues. Seems we have extra sensory perception. You can send me thoughts. I'd have no objection. Now we can fly high in the sky. We'll live forever. We'll never die. God, please let us go on this way, eh? Brian Wilson is a crazy person. You, you can tell throughout this album, there's all this like little inner monologue that he's clearly having with himself that just somehow made it into a song. And you're just like, oh, oh, that's not a good look. No, well, I'm actually surprised and disappointed more of his mental illness isn't on display in these songs. You oh, get glimpses is, for sure. Oh my God. <laughs> he is trying to, and again, until we really get into it, we'll give him the benefit of the doubt, date uh, children, hang yeah. out with children. <laughs> Allegedly. Hang Allegedly. Out. We'll get there, Tim. We have not put forth the full evidence yet. I mean, granted, he has enrolled at a high school as a 16-year-old boy and girl, Brian and Brianne Wilson. <laughs> Oh, I like that. I mean, people do that sort of shit to twins all the time. This is our twin boy and girl, Brian and Brienne. Yeah, and and if if you're thinking of having twins, don't do that. Mm -hmm. Tim, I have a funny sounds like. The cadence of the song is something along the lines of, God, please let us go on this way, yay. So you get the the way, yay throughout the song. Every fucking time, all I could think of is that stupid SNL sketch they've been doing for the last 18 years. I wish it was Christmas today. (laughs) Well, now that's stuck in my head, you you cunt. Says. Yep. Anyway, well, then we get a heck of an outro. You basically just get God, please let us go on this way a eh? over and over and over. Yep. And we're going to have a lot of those because a good portion of these songs, they wrote a verse and then mm-hmm. we're just like, oh, well, what if we just sing the last line of the verse as an outro for 30 seconds? It's kind of song length adjacent. Yeah. I love when a song just fades out. <laughs> Track number two, the controversial roller skating child. <laughs> Let's give him the benefit of the doubt. He wants to hang out with children in a very innocent way. Oh, well, okay. We're giving him the benefit benefit of the doubt. doubt's different (laughs) than mine. My benefit of the doubt is that child is slang for a hot lady. Oh, no, it's not. Okay, well, Tim, you got to understand. It's the 70s. Roller skating was an adult fad. Let me, I'll I'll explain why. It's it's very much not. (laughs) (laughs) Tim, with the firm stance that this is dating a child. Yes. Verse one starts off, well, she's a roller skating child with a ribbon in her hair. She gets my heart to beating when I see her there. You know my heart starts smiling when she sings. She's such an angel, I bet she's got wings. So if you ignore the word child, that's fine. He likes a roller skating girl. A woman. A woman who <laughs> what roller does that skates. Mean? A woman who roller skates. He's into her. That's her thing and she's his thing. That's fine. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But it also kind of sounds like a predator hunting children at the roller skating ring. It does. It does. Now, this hits particularly close to home for me. I have a personal story. That oh, you got raped by Brian Wilson at a roller skating rink. Oh my God. <laughs> Wait, I guess wait, I don't wait. have a story. <laughs> Nail on the head there? <laughs> no, no, no. Luckily, I was taught stranger danger at a very young age, but I was once potentially at the site of an abduction at a Silver Wheels in Fort Worth, Texas. I stepped outside at my fourth birthday. I was looking particularly handsome in a green pair of overalls and a turtleneck with tiny people <laughs> skiing on it. And a gentleman pulled up and asked if I'd like a ride. Oh. Uh, luckily, yeah, luckily, uh, I ran back inside out of utter fear. Hmm. But uh, yeah, that guy totally tried to steal me. I could see that. Yeah. What does that mean? Well, I mean, just think about how much better your life would be if you'd been raised by that kind gentleman. I would be dead in a shallow grave after <laughs> right. unspeakable things. Oh, I see. <laughs> oh. Anyway, the chorus goes on, and we'll make loving when the sun goes down. We'll even do more when your mama's not around. Well, oh I, okay, my, I have to stop oh you. gosh, to stop oh you. gee, she really okay. sends chills inside side of me. <laughs> Indefensible. What's more than loving? And we're going to do even more? Right. Okay. So her mom's involved. This is a child. Oh, I see. She lives at home. That's point number one. Point number two is your thing, right? He's going to make sweet love to the roller skating child when her mother is present. But once she leaves, he's got darker things he's going to do. Like, Good I don't- Lord. I don't- Are we talking blood oaths? I don't know. I, I, Some I'm, sort of Nexium situation? Is he branding this girl? 
<laughs> I'm worried about a Tobin's Keith room situation, to be honest. I don't know. Jesus Christ. Yeah, but we can say pretty sure there's the word child, there's talk of what he's going to do when her mama's present, and then there's talk of going a bit further when her mother leaves. This is oh. about a child. I, maybe she's just, you know... She, uh, maybe late. she's just <laughs> mentally incapacitated and has okay. to live with her parents. Is that what you were going to say? No. Oh, no. <laughs> Jesus Christ, no. Maybe she's just in her early 20s, hasn't uh, figured out her career yet, lives at home. Maybe she's a deadbeat, real piece of shit, doesn't have a job, just sits around all day. <laughs> I- <laughs> Do not hire Brian Wilson to dress up as a, as a high schooler to try to seduce me out of this house. I'm not leaving. If, Tim, if, if I'm making a hire that comes out of this episode, it's going to be that Russian gentleman with the bat. <laughs> I like that guy. <laughs> Anywho. Yeah, so we don't really know what more means. I'm going to go with potentially branding, maybe summoning the devil. We don't discuss the occult nearly as much as we should on this show, but perhaps they're summoning the devil. Okay. They've got a record playing in the skating rink. She comes skating past me and she gives me a wink. We run into the kitchen and we grab a bite. Her folks let me stay with her up late at night. So many guys want a girl like mine. A love like this happens only one time. Now, what stood out to me here, Tim, is that she seems to have the cool parents. Although, if depending on the age here, she's either got the cool parents or the uh, woefully neglectful parents. Yeah, wow. I mean, it's both. This is a time like Jimmy Page had already committed a kidnapping and transporting a minor across state lines. So had uh, Steven Tyler. Oh, absolutely. Oh, wait, Maybe was that not. legal because he had adopted her? Oh, that was a sex daughter. Yeah, sex daughter. He adopted a minor uh, as his daughter so that he could have sex with her legally because apparently that's how the legal system works. I'm not a lawyer, but I suspect, I suspect that Steven Tyler had several look over the paperwork before he just announced he was doing that. <laughs> anyway, her folks let me stay with her. This is a child. This is a child. And for some reason, I don't hate this album. I should. Uh, Maybe she's uh, like in like 19. Maybe, maybe. Okay, but- okay. Maybe this is nostalgia and he is also young. I got another story for you, Tim, if you'd like. So remember that young lady who painted my face shut and then- and Her uh, father took came in and yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no. I do. That's <laughs> not what happened. No other member of her family performed any sort of sexual act on me aside from her. But you don't know that because you didn't open your eyes. I couldn't. They were painted shut. <laughs> um, <laughs> you'll have to go back and listen to the now infamous- shaggy episode. Anyway, now this same girl, Tim, we had a relationship question mark uh, for a bit around this time. This was high school. But what was always awkward and very uncomfortable is that she also had the cool parents. And I now know as an adult, the wildly neglectful parents. Yeah, and, and we the, could just the parents that would just if they see a boy's <laughs> face painted shut, it's just a speaking and no one's looking situation. I was not abused by that family. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Okay. Okay, fair enough. Go on, and tell us, go on and tell us your story about that time you were abused by this family. Go on. She Thank had the you. cool parents. <laughs> right. And so we would do stuff in her room with the door shut. And never once did they knock or inquire. However, her door opened directly to the kitchen where not on one, not on two, but on multiple occasions, I would emerge sweaty and red faced from whatever to a family sitting down and enjoying, say, Taco Tuesday. Yeah. Or some other <laughs> completely normal thing to be doing at 6.30 on a, on a weekday. Well, right. That's because her father knew why you were so red-faced and sweaty. Right. So why was he not pummeling me? Oh, knew firsthand why you were so red-faced and sweaty. No. <laughs> because one time when your face was painted shut, he um, did stuff. You're disgusting. <laughs> I, I, You're disgusting. Hey, 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 he's disgusting, Garrett. It's not your fault. Garrett? Don't. Garrett? Don't do this It's not me. your fault. It's not your fault. Don't do this it's me, not man. your fault. It's not your <laughs> fault. It's not your fault. It's not your Oh, that's a tight hug. Okay, okay, get off me, get off me, get off me. Get off. It's not your fault. Stay on your side. Nah, I'm just kidding. Get over here. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, basically, this song, this ode to a child, ends with them shouting "roller skating child" over and over <laughs> to the chagrin of everyone listening. <laughs> that's true. Track number three, Mona. Aren't you, aren't you 
third song on the album, first song, not about dating children. Yeah, that's nice. I like that part of it. Yeah, well, we don't know, because I don't know who Mona is. It seems like this is a song written... And see, this now brings it back, because I remember people doing this in high school, where somebody would, like, we'd have the English class where we did, like, poetry. You remember this. You wrote some poetry. And there was always the sad jackass that would, like, try and ask somebody to prom using a poem that they wrote for this class. This is what this is, right? This is a song written to ask someone on a date or to ask her to marry him, maybe? Are you saying that it sounds like it was written by a child? Yes. Because it does. Yeah. It's kind of got a 50 style, very inoffensive, uh, not rockabilly. That would be way too good. There it is. This is doo-wop. This is doo-wop. How about an eight o'clock dinner? How about a nine o'clock movie? Yeah, this is what he was into at the time. This is what he wanted the entire album previous to this to be. Boy, you know what this kind of is, Tim? This is almost... Paul McCartney rock. He yeah, this is an unfettered Paul trying. McCartney. If John Lennon had never gotten involved, this is what Paul McCartney would have been doing. Yeah, he was constantly threatening to ruin Beatles songs. <laughs> <laughs> I just want it to be more bubbly. Shut up. <laughs> <laughs> The song begins, Mona, comma, 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 come to me. Gimme, 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 some loving. Tell me, tell me, tell me, you want me. How's about an eight o'clock dinner? How's about a nine o'clock movie? Won't it, won't it, won't it be groovy? It's like they got a copy of the book of how many times you can say things in a row and they're just spitting on it. Oh yeah, they are disrespecting that book. Now, to be fair, in 1977, that book had not been written because you had not been born and I maintain you wrote that book. I've written in the book. I've added to it, sure. I believe you were the original author, sir. (laughs) This song is really, really bad. Seems to be about a lady named Mona, but that pattern, that way that we are reading the lyrics, and believe me, we are not putting nearly the English on it that they do. Never forget, this is all being sung like it's 1964 Beach Boys, and it's it's just awful. Yes, it is. If you think about it as a 315-pound, 35-year-old Brian Wilson dressed in a letterman jacket, (laughs) asking out a girl at a high school, it's a lot funnier. It's gross, but it is a lot funnier. Yeah. It's the equivalent of like the 90210 cast or any teen movie from the mid aughts where it's just like, that guy's 38 years old. I can tell. Why is he playing a high schooler? That's what Brian Wilson is doing, but he didn't bother to get in like shape or like try to make it look convincing. He's still got that beard. He's just got a bunch of band-aids trying to cover it up. (laughs) Just covering his face in band-aids rather than shaving. Well, he likes the beard. When he goes home, he wants to really just let that beard breathe. You get it. You've got a beard. Uh, sure. I got to imagine he's not fooling anyone with his Brienne. This oh, of course is. not. It looks like he's got a giant tumor hanging off of his face because it's just a loose beard that's covered in flesh colored band-aids. God. <laughs> less fun. You've made this less funny. <laughs> He goes from asking her out to trying to determine what time they should go see a movie to getting a little insistent. He goes, will you, will you, will you just kiss me? When you leave me, don't you just miss me? Could we, could we, could we get married? Enough, enough, enough of going steady. This is kind of a theme in Beach Boys music. You've got the wouldn't it be nice if we were older. When he started out, he was 18, 19. They were singing about hanging out on the beach. They were singing about surfing. They were singing to people their age that had just graduated from high school and it's fine. They're love songs. They're love songs that were meant to be played on early 60s radio. So you had a lot of the, you know... A lot of fluff. Yeah, exactly. But at this point in his life, it's 1977. He's 35. He's 315 pounds. It doesn't work anymore. Yeah, that mustache is full of cocaine. (laughs) Yeah, full of cocaine and it's being held down by a band-aid. It's a terrible look. Track number four, Johnny Carson. So this is weird because I really enjoyed the opening piano and vocals. You sure, Tim? Now this song has a real Mick Jagger feel, at least in the opening. I know what you're saying. It sounds really ominous. It sounds weighty. Yeah, it's got the Stray Cat Blues style, I've got a secret, and I'm also like slinking across the stage. Right. What I think it sounds like is Cat Stevens' I Think I See the Light from the Harold and Maude soundtrack. Ooh, that's pretty good. You know, end-to-end song-wise, that's a great comparison. I hit on the opening line. Yeah. He sits behind the microphone. 
home. Right after that lascivious line, <laughs> who sits behind the microphone, Tim? Johnny Carson. It is ridiculous. Yeah. In full-throated Beach Boys harmony. Johnny Carson. Yeah. And it, well, this it, is a song about Johnny Carson. Absolutely. Throughout this song, they do this incredibly strange ping pong vocal style where they bounce Ugh. back and forth between vocalists. Every other word, sometimes within words, different syllables. It's insane. I, I couldn't yeah, believe that. You know what, Tim? Let's play a game. You take the start and I'll do the alternate just to give everyone a sense of how jarring this is. Okay. It's nice to have you on the show tonight. That's horrible as a song. According to (laughs) to Bri Bri, the year this was released, he said, one morning I was on my way to the studio and I'd been thinking about how I'd seen Johnny on TV the night before. And I said to myself, God damn it. There's got to be some song about Johnny Carson. I mean, he's been an idol to so many people for so many years and why not a song about Johnny Carson? So I said, for Christ's sakes, when I got to the studio, I sat down and I goddamn cranked out a song about him. I'm definitely a fan. (laughs) He's so crazy. I love this song. It's so stupid. It's mostly organ and keyboards. Uh, Uh. It's a song about Johnny Carson. Ed McMahon comes out and he says, here's Johnny. (laughs) Every night at 1130, he's so funny. Then you get the weird syncopation between the various members of the band who make it almost nauseating to listen to. Uh, and, you know, that's kind of a two-minute song right there. He kind of ends it with, who's the man that we admire? Johnny Carson is a real live wire. The only other thing I want to mention about this song, the whole thing is about how much he likes Johnny Carson. But then there's this weird part in verse two where he says, when guests are boring, he fills up the slack. The network makes him break his back. Johnny Carson. Uh, apparently, at least a little bit of this is inspired by Wilson being kind of frustrated that people were expecting him to be consistently active. So he's kind of comparing himself and the pressure he felt to uh, Johnny Carson. This is one of the songs I would say definitely go listen to this whole song. It's like two minutes. It's fucking weird. Track number five, Good Time. Did you get the history on this song? No. Oh, so this is actually really interesting. Did they sound different on this song? Yeah, very. Okay. Yes. So unlike the other 13 songs on this album, this was recorded in 1970 and then just left unreleased until this album. Yeah. So and this is a completely different sounding song. Yeah. In 1972, actually, Brian's wife at the time, Marilyn Wilson, she did some vocal overdubs and released a version of this on her band, American Springs album Spring, and then they stripped it back and released it on this album. And it's a really weird inclusion because you hear the Beach Boys voices from seven years prior on this song, and then you compare that to every other song on this album, it just points out how much like Brian's voice has declined. It's it makes the rest of the album kind of sad. Yeah, the only reason that I picked up on it at all is that one of the notes I have is the chorus reminds you just how good Brian Wilson can sing. Yeah. But not and there's a reason. (laughs) Yeah. Because he couldn't. Right. Interesting. Now now, Tim, I this is going to be hard for you to remember because these songs all blend together. But I labeled this fucking thing proto ska. Yeah, there's a whole lot of strings. You put a little guitar under here at the right spots. You're you're looking at a real upbeat ska tone. I can see the skanking already. <laughs> yeah, I guess it's a song about enjoying a moment that you know is not going to last. Right? Oh, is it? Yeah. Well, the chorus maybe it won't last, but what do we care? My baby and I just want a good time. Might go up and smoke now, but what do we care? My baby and I just want a good time. So. It's You know what? I love that chorus. Not in the words I could give a shit about, but it sounds so good. Yeah. Yeah. No, again, this is, there are moments on this album that will make you just, oh shit, fucking Beach Boys. But it's Um, for like a word. And then there's this weird comparison between two women, Betty and Penny in verse (laughs) one and verse two. Betty is always ready to help him in any way. She'll do the cooking. She's always looking for ways she can make her day. She's the one that I guess he gets along with personality wise. And then- I think we got a sister wife situation. Yeah. It's his banging wife. Maybe it's his cooking wife. I'm not sure. Maybe. Because Penny in verse two, she's kind of skinny. So she needs her falsies on. She don't like cooking, but she's so good looking. I miss her when she's gone. She's the one, I guess, that Dee's going to bang. Right. I had to look up falsies. I did too. Yeah. I was like, oh, so just so we're clear, the line is my girlfriend, Penny, she's kind of skinny. And so she needs her falsies on. That apparently just means padded bra. Yeah. The internet would also suggest fake eyelashes, ass padding, or false teeth. Interesting. I think it was 
I think probably it's, not those things. Then. No, I think it's either the the bra or the ass padding because of the skinny line. It really seems like a term like it'd be more at home in like a Beatles song. I think. Oh yeah, like more like it's a regional dialect. Yeah, I also like in the line you read. She don't like cooking, but she's so good looking. I miss her when she's gone. Seventies were a real different time. Like men were so manly that they didn't even admit they liked their wives. <laughs> just, just like she's so attractive. I even am like when she's gone, I'm like man, you know what? I wouldn't mind if she was here. <laughs> wow, this guy really loves his wife, huh? Tim, let's get into this bridge. Whoa, 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 uh. Whoa, 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 whoa. Ah, this song isn't great. <laughs> and then you get a stupid outro. Good time, oh, good time, oh, good time, good time, good time. Hey. Yeah. It's uh, great. <laughs> Good stuff. Honestly, listen to it. And and that chorus, it's just dying for some big horns behind it and a guitar. And then we're looking at Ska. Yeah. Track number six, Tim's favorite song, Honking Down the Highway. Honking, honking down the gosh darn highway. <laughs> this was the single. <laughs> I called this ragtime Paul McCartney style rock. Yeah. Honestly, I love the opening of this. I really do. Before it gets real creepy. Oh, when he's just playing guitar or the oh, stupid so- song? No, the stupid song. Honking Down the Gosh Darn Highway is... Honking, honking down, down the gosh, gosh darn, darn highway. highway. I'd like an Elvis cover of this. Yeah. I mean, it would make more sense, but you know, only because it would have been released in 1958. <laughs> yeah. This does get real creepy. Again, remember, Brian is 35 years old. He's 315 pounds and he's pretending to be two uh, high schoolers. Got a a little date with an angel. She's the one that said she'd go with me to see a movie tonight. Honk, honk, honking down the highway. Her folks told me she's lonely. That's weird. He's he's setting up this date with her parents, not with her. It's not appropriate. And she loves me only. She's used to running away from guys. Praying, praying, Mm -hmm. she'll hold me tight. And hoping, hoping, She'll see the light. Who cares if I have to spend my money, even if I have to act funny, to go and steal her heart away? Okay. Well, I mean, Tim, we only came up with the theory of the Brian Brianne high school enrollment <laughs> fiasco. We got to give it a name. Not just one of the guys, not just one of the girls. Maybe volley and serve because it's got that that uh, volleyball aspect and it's a tag team, but it's with himself. I don't know. Oh, I like volley and serve. I don't know. I'm just not that familiar with a lot of volleyball terminology. It doesn't have to be volleyball. It doesn't have to be volleyball at all. Uh, it could be some sort be. of... Oh, well, that's... Please enhance your calm. It could be some sort of sibling thing. Some sort of... Si- <laughs> some sort of sister wingman. I mean, oh. in, the, in the screenplay, is it obvious that Brian is a 35-year-old man? Yes, right? Yeah, you got I mean, to. The audience knows he's an adult man. Yeah, it's way okay. creepier if he does a good job pretending. I think. Uh, or is it not? I don't know. <laughs> Anyway, I don't know. I doubt this thing is going to get greenlit. Yeah. Anyway, so he set up a date with this young lady's parents and he's going to put on an act so she will like him. He's going to, you know, even maybe throw down a little bit of cash, yeah. act funny. I thought that even if I have to act funny to go and steal her heart away, I took that to mean uh, if he has to lie and betray everything that is him in order to woo her, he's willing to do so. Absolutely. He, he will become whatever she's interested in. Absolutely. Yes. He's going to be a <laughs> relationship chameleon. And Tim, do you think that the parents were saying you'll probably get some action it seemed like her parents were like whoring out their daughter i don't know what's a nice way to say that i think he said it the nice way oh yeah because the song continues garrett take it one little inch at a time now (laughs) until we're feeling you know what i'm gonna read that again because you're laughing over it and i people need to hear what brian wilson says there (laughs) all right i'll shut up take it one little inch at a time now (laughs) until we're feeling fine now i guess i've got a way with girls He's got a system. Yeah. Yeah, he's... Slow uh, and steady. (laughs) Inch by inch. Jesus Christ. He's going to make her take an inch at a time until they both feel fine. Oh, my God. That's what he's saying. That is in the song. No, I don't think it is. Oh, sure. His words are your words, not his. No, (laughs) his. His. Now, again, every time he says honking down the gosh down highway, completely (laughs) redeemed. In the bridge, he says it five times in a row. Yeah. And that's fine. Yeah, he does. Yeah. Honk, honk, honking down down the the gosh down highway. Yeah. Honking down the gosh down highway. Yeah, I'm into this song. I mean, it's horrible. It's horrible. It's so bad. Yeah. And these are adults. Track number seven. Ding dang. Ding dang. Ding dong. Ding dang. 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 Ding d
I guess they needed another 57 seconds just to fill out side A here. Yeah, what kind of contractual obligation is this nonsense? <laughs> Did you read about how this came to be? I assume it's a vocal warm-up. <laughs> okay. Did you see the authors credited on this? Uh, maybe. It's Brian uh. Wilson and Roger McGinn, who is essentially the Brian Wilson of the birds. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So, let me tell you how this came to be. McGinn was sitting around at his house one day, and Wilson drove up, came to the door, and asked for amphetamines. <laughs> He opens the door, Brian's parked there, and Brian says, I just wanted to see you. Do you have any speed? To which he replies, <laughs> why, yes. Are you sure <laughs> Are you sure you should be taking it? And Brian Wilson replied, I'm running away from Dr. Landy, so it's okay. And then they gave him a bunch of amphetamines. They gulped it down and started drinking, playing pool. Brian started playing his piano, and he found a particular tune and came up with something on the fly. He kept playing it. Then Roger left and came back back after five to six hours after he had gone to sleep and woke <laughs> up the next morning and Brian was still at the piano playing the exact same thing over and over and over again and so they put it on this record and this has the he, same ping pong vocals from Johnny Carson right uh, oh yeah absolutely I guess we'll call it a call and response but they're not words so it's not that <laughs> yeah boy when you said it was Wilson and again I thought for sure you were going to tell me they developed their own language <laughs> this is <laughs> this, this is, is no their mothers. Code. Yeah, I feel silly reading it, but I'm going to do it. <laughs> ding, ding, dang, woo. Ding and a ding dong. Ding, ding, dang, woo. Ding and a ding dong. I love a girl. I love her so madly. I treat her so fine, but she treats me so badly. Keep in mind, there's like four people singing individual words in what Garrett just read. Yeah, no two dings are performed by the same person. <laughs> and don't even get me started on the woos. But that whole little spiel I just uttered out is repeated twice before the last two lines about that girl he loves so madly are then repeated twice. And that is the 58 second song that is Ding Dang. Side number two, track number eight, Solar System. The planet's me. This feels kind of like a lazy outtake from Pet Sounds. Kinda. I but just... But minus... Oh, the singing is completely different. I thought it felt kind of like a Yellow Submarine-esque throwback. I mean, it's dumb, but... Yeah, I mean, if you think about it, Garrett, what do the planets mean? <laughs> Fucking magnets. How do they work? Uh, magic? Now, Tim, I've got a great sounds like for you. Did you get the sense that the singing on this sounded in any way different than the other songs? Not offhand. Okay, so to me, it sounded far more croony. I agree with yeah. that. Yeah. So, like, I'll take the sentence you just did. All right. Here's my sounds like. What do the planets mean? Is a lot like Mr. Burt Bacharach. What the world needs hmm. now is love, sweet love. It sounds yeah. weirdly similar. And that is not what I want out of my Brian Wilson. No, definitely not. It's way too sing-songy. It almost borderlines on a musical style delivery. Capital M. Yes. So, again, I think this is a dumb song. I think it's immediately forgettable. Brian claimed the lyrics he came up with while driving to a parent's meeting at his daughter's school. What? And he said, and I'm quoting here, this is a great song. The lyrics are great. The melody is great. I've got a beauty here. When I'm 90, I'm going to be as proud of this song as I am now. <laughs> <laughs> I doubt that. Boy, could you imagine Brian Wilson at a PTA meeting? Oh, that'd be I great. So excited. Oh, no. <laughs> this Garrett, is going to be way better. You have to understand, when he says he's going to his daughter's school, that's him. Mm. He's the daughter. Of course. Of <laughs> course. I mean, maybe he has a daughter enrolled there. Who knows? Maybe oh, he's trying to befriend his daughter. <laughs> oh, no. No. Because the other- Oh, not like that. The other- Jesus Christ. The boy version of him is trying to bang the person that his daughter is- the daughter version. It's really confusing. Let's just leave his any actual children out of it. He doesn't have What children. if he's just trying to bang himself? What if the boy <gasps> version is trying to bang- Bang the girl version of Brian Wilson. Brian's trying to bang, bang Brianne. I love this because everyone's a 35-year-old adult. <laughs> right. Everybody's of age and it's all basically hinging on severe mental illness. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's just- Which, it, you know, like the real Brian Wilson. Yes. Now, granted, it is happening at a high school filled with children, but oh, they sure. got to learn sometime what mental illness is. Some of those people are probably going to go on to become psychiatrists that are going to do a better job than Eugene Landy. So- Yeah. And net positive. Uh, if that means that- sure, 
sure a guy took himself to prom, a 35 year old <laughs> man took himself to prom. Sure. That's, that's a couple of years of therapy. It's better than a 35 year old man dressed as a boy, dressed as a girl, seducing a girl on the volleyball team. Absolutely. That's a lifetime of therapy. Yeah. He sings oh. about the planets as though somebody just told him about them. Or at least told him about <laughs> astrology for the first time. Saturn has rings all around it. I searched the sky and I found it. Good <laughs> job, Brian. Yeah. Solar system brings us wisdom. I thought he might mean that uh, all of our modern technology of, as of 1977 was actually taken from aliens that crashed on our planet. Oh. Seems like a Brian thing. It does. I think this is just about how he kind of likes astrology. I think you're right. Yeah. Astrology or astronomy? Ast uh, which one's oh, the both? fake one? Well, let me uh, read the next line. The constellations are stars that form animals. Leo and Capricorn too. So it's both astrology and astronomy. Fair enough. Neptune is god of the CEE. -E. Pluto is too far to CEE. -E. I'm not a fan of pretending that homonyms are rhymes. Yeah, I know. It's a cheap, lazy way of writing. Can I say a controversial thing? Hot take? A Garrett Harvey original hot take, Tim? You may. I don't like constellations. Oh no, they all look like uh, nothing. They look like stars. Yeah. The Big Dipper I, I will allow. That's it. Yeah, I can usually find that one. Aside from that, I'm boy, you know, I thought we were going to be fisticuffs over this. I'm glad to see we're on the same page. This, you know, this is why we work. I'm just sick and tired of people pointing out constellations as though they're things we can see. I don't believe it. I don't see it. You don't see it. Stop saying that's a man shooting an arrow or an elephant or a bear. No, let me ask this. Does this stars. come up a lot? All the time. No. Oh. Every night that I go out, some asshole is like, oh, look, it's Cassiopeia. Hmm. Then this must be very hmm. frustrating. Incredibly so. Yeah. I, I, I basically don't go outside at night anymore. Yeah, I mean, that's smart. <laughs> nah, I'm just tired of being made feel a fool because I can't find Orion's belt. Yeah. I mean, we can practice. We got this big hole in the wall. Sure. But every time I look at the hole, filled with rage. Rage at you. <laughs> Track number nine. For making the oh, Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Track number nine. The night was so young. This might be the worst because this song is sung by a villain. <laughs> yes, it is. It is. <laughs> this song, I think, is about pining after the young lady from the first two songs and Brian not understanding why society won't let him do what he wants. Sure. I mean, well, let's get right into it. The night was so young and everything still. The moon shining bright on my windowsill. I think of her lips. It chills me inside. And then I think, why does she have to hide? <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> I mean, it's obvious why she has to hide. If your spouse, partner, husband, boyfriend, fella who's now alone has to ask, why is she hiding from me? I don't get it. Then you're smart to hide. Oh, absolutely. And it, it continues then because in the chorus, it says, is somebody going to tell me why she has to lie? I, I, she'd be so right to hold me tonight. Love was made for her and I. She <laughs> <laughs> I don't think so. So, do you think she removed the band-aids and discovered that, that he was, in fact, a fully grown beach boy? <laughs> Now she's gone into hiding. <laughs> Quite possibly. It's three o'clock. I go to my sink. I pour some milk and I start to think, is she asleep or is she awake? And does she think of the love we could make? Wake up. Call me, baby. Call me. Tell me what's on your ma mind. I've got a car and you're not too far. Please let me come over to you. If this song was about an adult, why would she have to lie? Why would she be impressed or surprised that he has a car and can just go to her house whenever he wants? and wait for her outside to sneak out her window and then take her across state lines and maybe to Mexico. Possibly adopt her. Yeah. Make everything nice and legal. Yeah, of course. I like the music on this song, though. Yeah, I don't mind it. It's, I, it's got like the classic Beach Boys harmonies on this one. I mean, again, voices are not that great, but it's also got the George Harrison-esque slide guitar. Oh, yeah. I just wish it wasn't about a child. Yeah. I God, I didn't even pick up on that till, till we got into it. You might be getting me there, Tim. This is is a lot of songs dedicated to the abduction of children. <laughs> Maybe more than I can handle. Two things stuck out to me in the verse you read. One, who gets up at three o'clock in the morning, goes to the sink and pours a glass of milk. That is suspicious. I don't trust that person. Well, I think milk has the classic, it helps you go to sleep thing. Ugh, that's not what's going to happen to me. Oh, no. You are lactose intolerant. You are intolerant of lactose. You will stink this place up. I'm not going to let it stop me, though. Ice cream, 
Bring it on. Yeah. You eat cheese by the handful. Like an apple. Wow. Just a wheel of cheese. <laughs> anyway, the other part is it sounds like he may have figured out where she is because he says he's got that car and that she's not too far. He wants to come get her. Oh, uh, yeah. Well, he knew where she was because the parents let him do what he does. We know that from previous songs. But I think now maybe the parents have soured. They think, ah, you know, that, that Band-Aid's coming off. I can really see a lot of mustache under there. So <laughs> maybe not anymore. And then he's going to sneak over. You you know, with all that in context, let's just leave the listeners with the, the final reading of the verse, knowing now that this is a man who's in pursuit of a young girl that's exposed his lies, uncovered the band-aids, both proverbial and literal. Uh, and the song goes, the night was so young and everything was still. The moon shining bright on my windowsill. I think of her lips, it chills me inside. And then I think, why should she hide? To me, Tim, that sounds like a man justifying his actions. It was her fault. She started it by running away and hiding. Oh, oh dear. Yeah, well, he found her, came on over there, got her. Track number 10. Oh, I'll bet he's nice. Not since Lou Reed met James Hetfield has a stranger combination been foisted upon these ears. These boys meet aggressive synthesizer. <laughs> yeah. It is jarring. It's also the rare breakup song that's written from like an actually mature perspective. It seems to be somebody recognizing that there's somebody else that may be better suited for the person you're breaking up with, right? I bet he's nice. Okay. I bet he's twice as nice as me and it makes me cry because I remember you and please don't tell me if it's true because I'm still in love with you. So he's still in love with this person, but he can see that her new guy might be better suited for her. I think that's a dead on reading. I'll give you just one alternate theory just for funsies. Maybe he just likes getting cucked out. Oh dear. Yeah. So he's just shouting that from the corner. A real, <laughs> uh, a real case McCoy. <laughs> allegedly. Oh, super allegedly. He I'm is a listener. certainly not saying that he stood in the corner and pleasured himself while uh, another man sexually assaulted a woman. I would never say that. I've never said that. That. Those words you just heard, that wasn't even me. I'm just saying people have said it. But again, super, I can't even say, not even allegedly, Tim, because I'm saying it didn't happen. But yes. allegedly, in case legally, <laughs> I need to say that. <laughs> Anyway, the song continues. I'll bet he's sweet. Bedo you. I don't even know how to say that. I'll bet he's neat. I'll bet he's funny. And that ain't all. I'll bet he shows you quite a ball. I guess they just mean having a ball, or does he mean getting balled out by this new dude? Not that. Good time. <laughs> Tim, I would appreciate it if you could expand your mind. I mean, what do the planets mean? I can tell you what all the planets mean, but we'd have to go no. hunking down the gosh darn highway for me to get out. We've got to get out of the city. I can point out some stars, point out some constellations. We'll really get I'll into it. You. Track number 11. Let's put our hearts together. It may sound funny, but you're the kind of woman. The rare duet. Tim, what do you think of Marilyn Wilson's singing voice? Better than Brian Wilson's at the time. Ooh, wow. Shots fired. I don't know if I'd go that far. I think she sounds like Meg White. <laughs> well, she's currently a real estate agent in Los Angeles. You can go tell her. After amicably divorcing in 1979 due to Brian's excessive mental illness and drug abuse. Yeah. I bought us a, a second West Coast location from her. Now, I know interest rates are well, no, about as low as they're going to get. The, we, remember I got the studio. It was owned by like Phil Collins or mm. Boy George or one of those guys. I don't really remember. Right. It seemed impressive at the time. Anyway, the point is, that's just the studio. We still need a place to live. Right. But we're out there so rarely these days. Well, right. But that's because we don't have a place to live out there. So, I got us a two-bedroom apartment. I had those bedrooms boarded up and I got us a couple of couch beds. This is am I mean, she, the ex- Mrs. Wilson actually helped me move the couch beds in there. Wow. Yeah. She is, I mean, at least 75 years old at this point. I didn't that ask. That's probably advised. Yeah, okay. Fair enough. Tim, this has a real weird sound to it. Best I can account for our younger listeners, it's it's almost got a weird lo-fi tuned down Mac DeMarco feel. I don't- All the guitars sound sad. <laughs> There's just a lot of warbling. It's kind of a throwaway. It's kind of a waste of a song. This is something to like sing with your wife while doing the dishes and maybe don't put it on an album. Yeah, but also don't sing it with your wife. Well, sure. Yeah. I think it's just a distraction from the subject matter of the rest of the album. This is his beard, if you will. Well, finally, after months of disappearing every day from the hours of 8.15 to 3.30, <laughs> his, his wife said, hey, 
Brian, what are you doing? And she is like, oh, uh, release, I'm putting together an album. Uh, you want to you wanna help? <laughs> she was like, great. Well, I'll be at the studio with you tomorrow. And so this is the one <laughs> where they had to play. He's like, I oh, just play along. And then, yeah, of course, somebody, she, le- she left the next day and it was back to high school. Yeah. Go parakeets. Carl got a desperate phone call. Hey, man, I need you to write a song for tomorrow and tell my wife I wrote it. <laughs> Maybe a whole album, Tim. This <laughs> might explain <laughs> what's going on. And the whole time, you know, they said Marilyn and, and Brian divorced amicably just two years later due to his mental illness. It could have been the content of this album. It's like they got that one song about how much you love me, Brian. But then all those other songs seem to be almost exclusively about you masquerading as a teen. <laughs> 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 poorly. So poorly. So poorly. So the song says, I don't want to tell you that I care for you and have you just ignore me. It's better that I wait and see just how you feel and maybe you'll adore me. What I like about this, Tim, is opposite of usual MO on our on our show. This guy's going to play it cool. He's not going to pour his heart out to a, an absolute stranger and then get furious when they don't retaliate or reciprocate. <laughs> I don't know how feelings That's work. so telling. You're telling. Fuck off. Yes. <laughs> I know it may sound funny, but you're the kind of woman who would make a very sweet wife. Speeding things up a little bit. Sure. I've said those now, exact words to you, actually. You slapped me yeah. right in the face. Slapped the shit out of you <laughs> for that. Fair. That's not Costco talk. <laughs> Track number 12, I Wanna Pick I You wanna Up. I wanna wash your feet Change your clothes and We're getting another real dichotomy here, Tim. Real dichotomy. Yes. Is this... <laughs> A song about the joys of being a father. Or is this baby play? Okay. I don't want to address what you just said. It's... So, yeah, I had the same thing. I thought this was either his, like, John Lennon's Beautiful Boy. It doesn't matter if this is a super innocent song. In the context of the rest of this album, this is creepy. We're not going to be able to sidestep this baby play, so let's put some parameters around it. (sighs) I don't now listen, Tim. Listen, not only have you and I spent a good amount of time watching My Strange Addiction uh, and various other BB. I don't want it though. I don't want to. I don't want to. Tim, I'm going to put some. I'm going to put some. I'm going to put some boundaries around it so that you're more comfortable in the space. Just stick with me. When I say baby play for the purposes of this conversation, the sexual arousal comes solely from the person, people, I'm not sure, enacting. Is it less weird if both people are pretending to be babies? (laughs) It is. It's so much less weird, but. Here's the important part. Here's the part that's going to keep us from vomiting through the next two to three minutes. When I say baby play for the purposes of this song, what's arousing to them is dressing like a baby, being treated like a baby. They do not have sex with that baby. How about we just say there, it, nothing's arousing about this. They just like it being a baby. They're just into it. Yeah. Okay. For non-sexual, you know what? there's no no boners are happening. Uh, yeah. You know what? Um, let's do that. That sounds good. Why does, uh, why does Brian Wilson sound like Randy Newman on this song? He does on a couple of these actually. It's a weird, yeah. like he sounds drunk. Yeah, he's stuffy. Yeah. I love to pick you up because you're still a baby to me. Cribs and cradles and bottles and toys. I want to wash your face. I want to change your clothes and button your shoes. Walk you around and wrestle with you. Then I'm going to make you sing. <laughs> That's a weird... <laughs> It gets. <laughs> this is a man that's gonna dress up his partner like a baby. Maybe he's talking to. Maybe he's regressing. So he he's a thirty five year old man who is pretending uh-huh. to be a high schooler. Well, maybe those sure. high schoolers want the same thing. So now they're pretending to be babies. <laughs> it's an inception of <laughs> yeah. of disguise. So this thirty five year old man posing as a sixteen year old girl and boy is now also posing as a three-month-old baby. <laughs> That's right. And that he is taken care of. Unbelievable. And by possibly. that I mean absolutely astounding. <laughs> and possibly his wife has to take care of him. <laughs> <laughs> I want to tickle your feet, drop you in your little tub, wash your body and shampoo your hair. Be careful not to sting your eyes. <laughs> <sighs> Now, Tim, have you ever been bathed as an adult or semi-adult? No. I have. What? (laughs) Were you... Were you being a baby? I was, luckily at the time, not being a baby. No. So, uh, it was a sponge bath, if that helps. I hope you were severely, like, in the hospital, right? Yeah. Okay. I was in the hospital. Fun side note, though. I don't know if I was in high school or college at the time. I was somewhere between 17 and 19. And Fred. (laughs) Oh, my God. Fred bathed you? No. (laughs) 
Oh, goodness. So, no. Thank God. <laughs> Jesus Christ. First of all, that's scarring for all the obvious reasons. But second, that man does not have a soft touch. <laughs> oh, no. He is gruff with a sponge. <laughs> <laughs> Gross. No. So uh, I was in the hospital. A wire brush. (laughs) Anyway, no. So I'm in the hospital for untold reasons. Severely, severely injured. Can't move. So they they they're sponge bathing me. They're they're just running a cold sponge over my body. Well, the woman comes in to do this, and my father was in the room, you know, looking after me, so to speak. And he goes, "I'll I'll leave you alone for this. Uh, You probably don't need like an audience." And oh, thank you, Fred. Appreciate that. Well, this woman was lovely. Just a she was a younger younger nurse and she took it upon herself to perform her sponge bath by removing her shirt. How Uh, many times have you been molested? (laughs) (laughs) Oh, I don't want to get into semantics, Tim. (laughs) Anyway, so Fred apparently came back somewhere in this process and before he came in, he realized what the fuck was happening and left because he's Good man. Anyway, she wraps up. Things finish. Great. Highlight of my week for sure. And I'm, you know, I'm so severely, gravely injured in the hospital that I'm just looking up this whole time. This this whole experience ends and I'm kind of recounting things in a morphine haze. And then just completely over my head pops Fred. Hey, you think she does that for everybody? <laughs> <sighs> I don't think so, Fred. Uh, well, at least this one, you had a second pair of eyes to make sure it wasn't her father. Yeah, that's true. But then she, then he was so tickled with himself, he laughed loudly into my mouth. So. Well, that's where you get it from. <laughs> uh, track number 13, Airplane. It's a weirdly pro-airplane song by a guy who famously had a panic attack on an airplane and in 1977, I don't think, was flying. No, he was not getting on airplanes. It must be a metaphor. Uh, For quaaludes, maybe? Over the city, in an airplane, I can see everything below. The houses, they look so tiny. The cars look like dots. This song was written by a nine-year-old. Yeah, but it also seems very literal. Uh, My lover is waiting at the airport. Soon she'll be kissing me hello. The woman sitting next to me tells me about her guy, and I tell her about you and I. Tim, are you a talker on the airplane? Yeah, of course. Of course. Oh, God, you're the worst. (laughs) I will look and find one physical characteristic of whoever is sitting directly to my left. Unless I'm sitting at the window, but I try never to sit at the left window. Anyway, I'll find one physical characteristic, and I'll just talk about that for hours. So let's say, for example, a guy has a big mole on his face. I'll ask him about it. Where'd you get it? How long's it been there? Did it hurt? How do I get one? Interesting. I'm so sorry I asked. Yeah, no, Uh, I'm not going to ever speak to a person on an airplane, Garrett. I'm listening under headphones and I'm developing a horrible back cramp. Yeah, that is airplanes. I can't stand anybody who starts talking to me when I have fucking headphones in. Is there a more polite and passive way to say, I clearly don't want to speak to you? It's not my fault you got on an airplane with nothing to do. I'll just go stare at the back of the seat. Yeah, I do eat hummus on the airplane often. Yeah, I know you do. Okay. Anyway. some reasons. Yeah, I wrote down, maybe this is secretly an ode to Prozac. Oh, yeah. Just pleased his punch with the most simple thing. Yeah, that's what's letting him be on the airplane. As if this song wasn't vapid enough, we then get a one, two, a one. One, two, three. I can't wait. Can't wait to see her face nine times in a row. Yep. It's a hell of an outro. Track number 14. Love is a woman. Love is a woman. He so sounds down. drunk on this song. Yeah. Love, yeah, what I like about it. love is a woman. It's like a yeah, it's, drunk Dylan. He says, love is a woman, so treat her tenderly tonight. Love makes a woman, so give her all your love tonight. Tim, does your fuck style determine the child's sex? No. Oh. No, that is well, a chromosomal, disagree. Uh, chromosomal thing. It's You tell that to Al Jardine. I did. I've told him. What did he say? Hey, he was very pleased. He, I mean, not everyone knows everything early on. You can be a lifelong learner. Sure, sure. But I have heard that different positions will produce different sexes. Right, but they won't. No, no, no. It's, what about it, like it, behind though? No, no, no. Like sperm cells, Garrett, they, they divide meiosis and mitosis. So this is a mm-hmm. meiosis process. You're dividing sure. 46 chromosomes into 23 chromosomes. So you have an X and a Y in half the sperm cells. So it's really just a numbers game. Yeah, but like what about like on top? Oh, yeah, on if top. Like good, on top. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Thank you. Okay. I, I Sorry, I should have been clear. Yeah. I really uh, hate the only verse in this song. Oh, yeah. It's a real treat. Yeah. One, two, three, two. 
two, three, ah, she's fallen in love with me. Four, five, six, five, six, ah, she fell for all my tricks. Seven, eight, nine, eight, nine, she makes me feel so fine. This is like the culmination of the album. He has succeeded. He has tricked this girl. He's driven to her house. She came out. He got her in the car and he's- Absconded with her in a stolen airplane yep. to British Columbia. Yep. And that's the album. Yeah, we did it. Tim, how'd this thing do? This did mediocrely. It hit number 53 on the Billboard 200 in the US, number 28 in the UK. I don't know how many copies this album sold. However, the Beach Boys have easily sold well over 100 million albums worldwide. They have 30 studio albums. So by that logic, this has sold a little bit over 3.3 million copies. That math does not check out. No. They have 55 compilation albums to compile 30 studio albums. Well, huh. Yeah. Seems, uh, seems like a cash grab. Yeah. At least 20 of them. Yep. What do people think of it? Well, Garrett, we have a Robert Criscow review. No. Yes. Uh, so that we're going to play the Robert Criscow game. I'm going to read the review of noted crazy person and dean of rock critics, Robert Criscow. And Garrett's going to guess what grade he gave it. The little catch here is that Robert Criscow is a crazy person whose review may or may not relate in any way to the album and his grade may or may not relate in any way to the review. Garrett, you want to play the Robert Criscow game? Let's do it. Painfully crackpot and painfully sung, but also inspired, not least because it calls forth forbidden emotions. He gets it. For a surrogate teenager to bear his growing pain so guilelessly was exciting. Surrogate teenager, his alternate person. <laughs> Criscow got it. Yeah. To bear his growing pain so guilelessly was exciting, or at least charming. For an avowed adult to expose an almost childish naivete is embarrassing, but also cathartic. And for a rock and roll hero to compose a verbally and musically irresistible pay-in to Johnny Carson is an act of shamanism, pure and simple. As with Wild Honey, the music sounds wrong in contradictory ways at first, both arty and cute, spare and smarmy, but on almost every cut it comes together soon enough. I am especially partial to the organ textures, and I find the absurd little astrology ditty solar system impossible to shake. As for the words, well, they're often pretty silly, but even, especially when they're designed to appeal to what Whatever Brian imagines to be the rock audience, they reveal a lot more about the artist than most lyrics do. And this artist is a very interesting case. Garrett Harvey, what grade did Robert Criscow give this? Robert Criscow gave this a B minus. Robert Criscow gave this an A. <laughs> <laughs> Robert Criscow loves this album. Uh, I'm so glad to hear that. It just <laughs> reaffirms that we have the right man. Like, <laughs> what in the fuck? This is terrible. Yes. Yes, it is. <laughs> Oh, any Amazon reviews? There are 21 reviews, 4.7 out of 5 stars on average, 84% 5 star, 3% 1 star. Uh, in 2015, Stevie Dow said, well, it's a classic, truly. Yes, much different from what the average fan would expect from a BB's album, but this is the pure distillation of Brian Wilson. Not the complete person slash genius, but of where he was quote unquote at during the time of the recording. There is so much charm, innocence, beauty and warmth in this album. It is utterly brilliant. I agree mm. that it is lo-fi and demo-like in places, but for me that just adds to the joy, as do Brian's lyrics. Crazy and out there, but in a good way. He's such a beautiful soul, Brian. I just love hearing his songs no matter how incomplete they may sound. I would have paid full price just for Let's Put Our Hearts Together, one of my favorite songs of all time. Thank you, what? Mr. Wilson. Five out of five stars. These people are crazy. <laughs> one more. This is from 2014 by A Shopper. It's called There's a Reason This is a Cult Classic. This is the most Brian Wilson-y thing ever created, and it shows. Hmm. If you're expecting anything resembling their radio hits, look elsewhere. Drenched in moogs with only one song featuring guitar, it's ultimately more new wave than rock. For those who care about the sound, overall, it's pretty decent. The bass is buried, which unfortunately, in my opinion, hides the farting synth sound and takes the punch out of a couple of songs. Five out of five stars. Interesting. <laughs> Weird reviews this yeah, week. One, okay. or one, I, I'm not going to read this other review, but one person called it softly autistic, and I think that might be the most accurate <laughs> description of this. Yeah. Love of planes, a lot of counting. <laughs> Check out. 
Yep. Okay, uh, Tim, who is this for? Robert Criscow. Yeah. And Brian Wilson in 1977. Yes. God, I'd be curious to hear him speak about it now. Yeah. It's The problem is it's the same thing as like the, the Lou Reed revisionism where it's – you can't admit that just, nah, it was kind of a misstep. I mean, he seems to have his life mostly together. I'd be curious to see. Yeah, you're probably not going to get much more of a, yeah, we were trying some different stuff on that. Yeah. Okay, Tim, final thoughts. Is there anything we haven't said about this album? We've really pull, pulled it apart. Nope. All right. Boy, final thoughts are quite succinct today. Do you hate this album? No, I still don't. I think it's weird. It's it's not very good. I think it's kind of a failure. It's an interesting failure though. And I think that it's a little disappointing because the amount of weird experimentation here, it's it's a shame that we didn't get a second Pet Sounds after this. Yeah. But yeah, it's way better than Sweet Insanity or Smart Girls though. Oh, by a country mile. Yeah. What about you, Garrett? Did you get there? No, sadly <sighs> no. It's too funny. And Tim, honestly, this album is now going to be added to a small collection of albums that when you and I get in the car together to go somewhere, you know, not next week, not next month, but like two years from now, one of us will put this on and then we're going to listen to it start to finish because that's how things work around here. Yep. And I'll enjoy that as a goof. Sure, sure. As a All goof. right. Classic goof. Okay, folks, as always, you can go to HeyPod.com, get every episode in every format you could ever want. You can also click on contact us in the upper left-hand corner. That'll email us and we want to hear from you. Send us your thoughts, your ideas, your suggestions, remixes of our songs samples, all sorts of weird shit. We want to get it. Or you can just email us directly at heypodmail at gmail.com. You can get us on Instagram at heypod. You can get us on Twitter at album heypod. We have Discord servers. We got subreddits. We're pretty much everywhere you want to be. So please reach out. We want to hear from you. And most importantly, if you can, if you can go out to iTunes, throw the five stars up there, maybe put the wackiest, weirdest review you can think of. That really helps out the show. So if you can do that, we appreciate it. For Why I Hate This Album, I have been one of your hosts, Scared Harvey. I have been and continue to be the God's Head, your key Keeper through this life. Nailed it. There's cowboys running through my dreams. Nothing's quite the way it seems. Well, I joined the Navy. I got kicked out in a week. My facial features aren't distinct. I try to find some meaning. The genius is a genius, got it wrong. Well, it's a lobster murder sex thing, the bleaching of the rear. Full of salt on both your ears. The riff to repetitive, the lyrics make no sense. All the songs are besides. Cover art's a mess and There's so much hair to tear apart Listen to it for a week Now the week has passed It's the Why I Hate This Album Podcast Tim and